this lesson we will talk about unofficial literature in the late Soviet Union and about the ways of its communication with the reader. In Stalinist society there was no underground because everything was frozen by fear. Of course there were writers who wrote for themselves and were writing into the table, as they used to say back then, aspiring someday it would be published in reality. But they never dared to distribute their works. The circulation of unofficial literature had started only in the times of so-called Khrushchev Thaw, T -H -A -W, in the first decade after Stalin's death. Typewritten publications began to, dis to be distributed with the help of just a typewriter in three, four, sometimes five copies. And this self-publishing house, or Sam is that, in Russian, uh, published everything that was not printed by the state, which had an official monopoly for printing. The state had an official monopoly for printing. This could be poets who for one or another reason were forbidden by the Soviet authorities, like Nikolai Gumilov, who was shot in 1921 for participation in anti-Soviet uh, rebellion or coup. Uh, this could be some works of long-dead writers, says Mikhail Bulgakov, many of whose works were not printed. This could be a migre poets or writers like Vladimir Nabokov. Uh, whose books from time to time accidentally and with great effort appeared in the Soviet Union. So everything that was banned or not allowed falls into the circle of self-publishing literature, self-publishing house, some is that. And of course this also included the great many texts of new, as yet unknown authors who could not be published. And gradually at the end of 1960s and in the beginning of 1970s, this movement was gaining significant influence in Soviet culture. Finally, it had become an alternative, different literature, and it had its own shadow institutions and processes exactly like the official literature. For example, it had its own literary magazines, such as The Hours or 37 magazine or Northern Post magazine. Some of them exist even uh, now. In the uh, 1960s, poets used to gather, uh, come together and recite their poems for the public. And such meetings were allowed by the authorities. The monument to Mariakovsky in the center of Moscow was a site of such poetic meetings. But afterwards, after the suppression of the Prague Spring, in 1968. All such activities were forbidden. Uh, but instead of them, in the 1970s, literary workshops were flourishing. Officially, it was accepted that those who studied in such workshops um, were preparing to become Soviet writers or poets. Uh, but in reality, they often concerned themselves with just free creative work. Certain seminars, meetings began to uh, be held. The authorities even admitted a constantly operating club for unofficial writers, which was named Club 81, named after the year uh, 1981, the year of its establishment. It was a paradoxically official club for unofficial literature. There was even a literary prize, although without financial part, uh, a prize in the name of Andrei Bailey, a famous modernist poet. The first prize was awarded in 1978 and it survived even in our time. Uh, it is a prize for innovation in literature. The groups of poets flourishing during this late Soviet period reminded the times of avant-garde. As Russian acmeists and futurists used to confront each other in 1910s, in the late Soviet unofficial literature appeared new advocates of classical acmeist writing, uh, for example, like the representatives of Petersburg Philological School, called so because they were the students studying uh, at the philology department of St. Petersburg University. And much more politicized and much more noisy Moscow poets of the SMOG group, S-M-O-G group, 
uh, smoke in Russian is an acronym for the youngest society of geniuses. One of the members of this society was Sasha Sokolov, the famous prose writer in the future. We will talk about him later. Some of these groups uh, had their own theoretical programs, uh, their own critics, theoreticians, who interpreted their creative work and helped the poets with self-reflection. At the same time, it must be said that the underground had a kind of synergetic, syn sorry, a syn syncretic uh, character, and it cannot be said that they represented a single or united literary trend or school. Here it is necessary to understand one more thing. Along with the sprouts of new literature, in that time there existed many directions in literature which were trying to rehabilitate the forgotten or repressed old avant-garde literature. The epoch of 1954-1968 is called Thou in Russian culture, or Spring, but is also often called the epoch of rehabilitation. And it makes sense because not only the repressed, uh, repressed and convicted people were rehabilitated in that time by also a culture that was forgotten or just as repressed as the people. And many writers considered themselves direct followers of avant-garde, for example of the futurists like Petersburg underground poet Viktor Sosnora or Moscow officially recognized poet Andrei Vaznesensky who was actually much more closer to the avant-garde than to socialist realism. Uh, the future Nobel Prize winner Joseph Brodsky in the beginning of 1960s made friends with Anna Akhmatova, uh, the leading acmeist poet, and her lessons were useful for Brodsky as well as for his friends Evgeny Rein, Anatoly Naiman and Dmitry Bobyshev, the neo acmeists and Akhmatova orphans as they were called. All these poets, and to the less extent prose writers, were the future of Russian literature. I should say a few words about a parallel phenomenon in relation to the self-publishing activity. That is the their publishing activity, their publishing house, or tam is that. There is a pun in Russian, words tam, their, and sam, self, are similar. Their publishing means everything to be published in the West. In other words, the, there were cases when writers were risking their freedom and even life while sending their manuscripts to the West for being published there. The first writers who did it were Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Daniel. In the year 1965, they had sent their fiction to, to the West and published it there under the pen names. In the USSA, the uh, USSR, they were arrested, accused and sent to prison for anti-Soviet propaganda. This point is consider considered to be the starting point of the dissident movement in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, in defense of the rights of them, they were convicted for five and seven years uh, in labor camps. Many writers have demonstrated, including well-known and official writers officially recognized writers. And since then uh, they all had a choice to try to acquire the official recognitions, recognition in the Soviet Union or to publish abroad and to stay in the underground forever. Publishing there in the West meant closing all the roads to printing press in the Soviet Union. At the same time, the third wave of immigration had begun. The first wave was the immigration during the Civil War. Uh, the second wave is usually attributed to the immigrants who stayed in the West uh, after the end of the World War II. And the third wave began in 1970s. And there were a lot of writers and poets among these new immigrants. Russian literature abroad found a new impetus, a new impulse, first after its high days in 1920s. And there were different tendencies in the immigrant literature. Of course, for the most part, this literature was anti-Soviet. But anti-Soviet often meant Soviet-like. In many cases, it was the Soviet literature just from the exact, exact opposite perspective. 
This, in many ways, is true for the great writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, as well as to such less known authors as uh, Georgi Vladimov or Vladimir Maximov, who were published in the Continent magazine and other journals, uh, more political than literally related. For them, the main criterion was not creativity, but rather social significance of the writing. But, on the other hand, some other trends had existed, for example, a satirical and humorous one. Uh, as its representatives, we could name Yus Alishkovsky or Vladimir Vainovich, who had recently died. This was intellectual satire. Among them, there was also a famous book by Alexander Zinoviev, the philosopher Alexander Zinoviev, The Yorian Heights where the Soviet ideology, ideology was brought to the point of absurdity. In the late 70s, the new publishing house Ardis was founded in uh, the city of Ann Arbor State, Michigan, in the United States. Uh, and it worked exclusively with the new Russian literature. It was a great support for new literature, of course. And along with old magazines, some of which dated back to 19. 20s, some new magazines appeared, such as Syntax, Time and Us, The Ark, and some others. These magazines, of course, had a small circulation, but sometimes they also found their way into the Soviet Union. Each of the immigrants had their own destiny and life journey. It is difficult to find anything in common between them, except the very fact of immigration. Once Sergei Davlatov said that all of us immigrants are right-wing. More right than us is only the wall, he uh, said. In fact, this is far from the case. Generally speaking, of course, they had anti-communist views, but among them was, for example, the strong leftist Edward Limonov, later a founder of Neo-Bolshevik party or the completely apolitical Sasha Sokolov, who cons considered politics to be below the level of his interests. The last thing that needed to be mentioned here is the permeability of different types of late so Soviet, anti-Soviet and non-Soviet uh, literatures. There were quite a few authors belonging to the official literature because they were printed in the Soviet Union, but at the same time they occupied liberal positions and could already be printed abroad or spread their works through self-publishing. A good example of such writers is Andrei Bitov. His masterpiece novel The Pushkin House was not allowed to be published in the Soviet Union as a whole, uh, but as the author himself says, about two-thirds of this novel was published under different headings in different collections of his works in the Soviet Union. But to publish it wholly, he had to address the bro to the same artist publishing house, which I spoke about earlier. An important milestone was the publication of the Almanac Metropolis in 1978 by the initiative of Vasily Aksyonov the collection of the best literary achievement, achievements of that time. And finally, one more phenomenon about which I will say just a couple of words. This is the third time for publishing by tape recording. In addition to the works that were actually printed on paper, this was another opportunity to deliver texts to readers. As such poets, such poets as Vlata Kujava, Alexander Galich, Vladimir Vysotsky were well known throughout the country, especially Vysotsky. All the people knew their poems by heart, but it was possible that during their lifetime such authors could not publish a single line. Vysotsky's first collection of poems was published only a year after his death. Nevertheless, everyone knew this poem during his lifetime by heart. And this is a picture, paradoxical in many respects, which has developed at the end of the Soviet era.